Go. We're live, Mr. Mm. Mr. Rune. Hello, so nice to see you. <laughs> nice looking to forward see you to too. this one. I definitely haven't uh, been, you know, staring at your face for the last 15 minutes. I wasn't trying to figure to this work out. No, <laughs> this is so spontaneous. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but yeah, but it's glad, glad to, glad to have, have you here, have us here basically to, to do this, um, this so-called interactive lesson where we're going to be, uh, well, at least, uh, the plan is to, to strengthen your opening play. I'd very uh, much like, uh, to have my opening play strengthened to a degree where I can crush my enemies, uh, impress the ladies and make my father proud, God rests his soul. Wow. <laughs> okay, that's a pretty intense uh, start. I don't know if I can promise all three, but we'll try and get at least two uh, of the three on the all checklist. Right. Uh, two for three? Two. We'll call, we'll call two a success, one an acceptable result, and all three, I don't know, you owe me a beer or something. <laughs> <laughs> Well, probably, probably we could work uh, uh, something out. Probably we can. <laughs> All right, sounds good. So I'll 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 show you like uh, what the format is. So for anybody who's um, who's uh, who's maybe in the chat right now or aren't too sure uh, what exactly is going on. Uh, the good news is, to some extent, we're also not too sure what exactly is going on because this is this is a kind of a new format. Um, we're going to be, you know, live streaming a lesson, and uh, I'm I'm uh, I'm a coach, uh, so I've been coaching for quite a long time. Uh, but coaching live to an audience is is different for me. Um, as for you, Rune, I don't know what your your uh, coaching history is. Have you have you worked with uh, with a coach in the past or with a few coaches? No, not at all. I am. I am one of those uh, disgusting people that just play Blitz online. And then sometimes I go to a crypt and then I just dominate uh, in the crypt, in the tournament, uh, but then get, get knocked out in the final stage of that Blitz tournament in a crypt somewhere in London. And uh, that's actually that actually happened. And it kind of happened because I I was meeting like real serious chess players in that tournament. It's one of the only real tournaments I ever played. And they know openings. And even though I was really on fire that day and I was just playing all the nice tactics so and I just had the vision. There. Excuse me? Uh, so your video camera, Mr. Bohone, is down and we're back yeah so you were saying i think you were saying that you were on fire i was on fire i was just yeah i was just crushing people left right yeah but then like the last game i played against somebody like 2100 something like that and he just he knew his openings and then he just sort of positionally i just didn't get like those sort of aggressive pieces all over the board kind of positions that i like uh, and then I didn't qualify. And if I had qualified uh, for the uh, end stages of the tournament, I would have gotten to play who would be crowned on that day the master of the crypt. Because this tournament was actually the first time I met you also. And you won this tournament and you became the master of the crypt. So I thought, who better to teach me the ways of the openings in chess than the master of the crypt himself? Yeah. Uh, I mean, <laughs> this is too high a level for me to uh, to be able to compete with. So I'll just tell the I won't I won't try to keep up uh, with your uh, with your beautiful eloquent use of uh, of the English language. But uh, what I'll do is I'll explain to the viewers what what the crypt was actually. It was a, a Ginger GM uh, event. Uh, so for those of you who are familiar with Simon Williams, aka the Ginger GM, it was a completely crazy event. That's where Rune and I met. And uh, and and what Rune is saying is basically he got knocked out of that event purely and only because uh, he hadn't done this lesson on strengthening your opening play before. And uh, so now we're going to sort of 
do the lesson so that next crypt event you can finally uh completely dominate am i am i following you oh yes that's so beautiful absolutely perfect, perfect. okay so let's let's talk about the format before we do what is your strength online so if you play on one of the major websites uh what kind of a rough rating does it translate into a fee day what what kind of strength do you think you you have oh uh, my on chess.com which i shouldn't probably say because we're probably streaming this to chess 24 but uh, i haven't played that much on uh, the chess 24 site even though it is of course very good also <laughs> uh but i think on chess.com my p grading is 1960 and usually I hover around somewhere between 1800 and 1900. Okay. Uh, then I dip a little uh, above 1900 and then, yeah, I go down to the low 1800. So that's sort of, I don't know what that translated into FIDE, but, uh, but it's based on a lot of online games. So it okay. should be fairly accurate. Yeah. And the thing is like, you're in a spot where a lot of players, right? Perhaps a lot of the viewers are around that kind of a range, you know, players who have taken chess, quite seriously it's a pretty serious hobby but on the other hand they don't you need to refresh your camera again sorry but the the stream uh, the camera Is cut it all out good now? it's all good perfect okay so uh, for those viewers, uh, we are sometimes encountering this slight, uh, slight little hitch or glitch or whatever here and there, uh, which is to be expected. We're working on a pretty, uh, pretty new, pretty new platform. So just got to iron out the kinks every once in a while. Um, but to, to go back to what I was saying, you know, uh, you're a guy who takes chess kind of seriously, works quite, quite a bit on it, plays quite a bit. Um, but doesn't quite have that, you know, degen background of 25 years of going to overboard tournaments, right? So a lot of people are are exactly in your in your shoes, and uh, hopefully, hopefully the lesson will will be helpful for uh, for more than just uh, yourself. Oh yeah, hopefully, yeah. Shall we Gotta dive maximize in? the effect of the lesson, yeah. Okay, let's dive in. I, I'll show you what what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about how to work on your opening play. Um, and the lesson is split up into two different sections. The first uh, aspect of the lesson, the first part, is going to be I'm going to show you some games where I played. The good news is the first time that I faced that variation, I got crushed. So you get to see me getting crushed a few times. Uh, but then I went back and I tried to figure out what would I do if I found myself in this situation or similar one in the future. And then we're going to try and apply that to your own games. Uh, so the kind of opening leaks that I'm trying to kind of plug might be a little bit more um, uh, nuanced, let's say, uh, as, as the levels get a bit higher in chess. But the concept is the same. So hopefully, hopefully uh, this is good format. And um, if you're ready to begin, we'll, we'll begin. Let's do this. Awesome. All right. So uh, first situation, I was playing uh, a fellow who is uh, quite good at chess. Uh, I believe his name is Magnus Carlsen. And we were playing a bullet game. And so I was, uh, I was black here. So let's actually flip the board around. Because um, uh, you're seeing it currently. Yeah, now you're seeing it from the black side? Yep. OK, awesome. So I played my trusty Karo Khan. And uh, just confirm with me that you cannot see any notations. No notation. I just see the position, the Carol Khan. Awesome. So in this position here, after knight c3, d5, d4, I took on e4. This is all normal theory and knight d7. This is the, the so-called Karpov variation. We're not going to focus on this because I know you're not. Uh, you're far too exciting of a player to play the Carol Khan. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so c3. And now, so the idea basically behind this this move, knight um, knight d seven, is just that you want to play knight f six, and then you know when they capture to be able to capture back with the knight. But actually, it's not even necessary to do this. You you can just play knight f six immediately. Uh, instead, it's another variation which we'll see. 
Um, okay, so I go knight f6, and Carlson chops here on f6, takes, and he plays this move bishop c4. And actually, this is, you know, you might think, right, why not play, I don't know, some move like knight f3 here? I mean, what's the difference between this or bishop c4? And I mean, of course, both lines can be played, but bishop c4 is a very annoying move to deal with. Uh, and the reason for it is because black would like to play in a particular way. He wants a particular development scheme. Uh, when you play the Karo Pan, you want to eventually put this pawn on e7. Uh, do you see the outline? Yep. Excellent. You want to put this pawn probably on e6 against this bishop, right? Because mm -hmm. it's kind of a monster and you also want to develop your own bishop. Mm -hmm. However, if you play the move e6, there is a consequence. There's one piece that is left kind of sucking a bit, right? What's mm -hmm. the piece? Uh, the light squared bishop. Exactly, the light squared bishop on c8. Mm -hmm. So, question is, how do you uh, complete your development here and get a decent position? Keeping in mind that you've got about three seconds to make a move max. Cause and, I'm playing, game, and I'm playing and Magnus playing Carlsen. Arguably the greatest player of all time. Yeah. <sighs> Just, you know, don't want to throw you in the deep end. No, 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 no. So, and I have to play, I guess, also better than you did. Okay, so I don't see the problem with just developing the bishop first, though. So okay. I would probably just play, like, and I wouldn't even spend three seconds. I would spend one and a half second, and I would play bishop f5. Basically, yeah, you, you, would, you would just assert dominance by pre-moving bishop f5. Yeah. Uh, however, there's a problem, a huh? question to the chat. Uh, now Magnus Carlsen could uh, arguably assert dominance over you with his next move here. Okay, so is there a sacrifice? There's a serious problem, and there's actually a key idea behind bishop c4. So maybe the chat can... Uh, yeah, so the chat is, um, is saying it here uh, on Twitch. I'm checking that out uh, for those of you who are... Uh, on Twitch, and also I'm seeing it on the Chess24. Uh, so some people have correctly pointed out the big move here is a double attack, Mr. Rune. Queen b3? Exactly, very good. So queen b3 here, and the problem is b7 and f7 are both under fire, right? So there's, there's no way to, to deal with this. So what did I do in the game? I played, I, I, I was familiar with this idea. So I just played, I had to play quickly. And I played the move E6. Uh, well, needless to say, Magnus got what he wanted. He kept me, he kept this bishop locked in here on C8 for me. And then he just developed his pieces. I tried to break on c5, but look, for now, my bishop is still on c8. Um, you know, I have some hopes at some point to develop it like this. So he just played very normal at that knight on e5. If I ever try something like b6, he might actually chop, give me this weak pawn. And then if I ever put my bishop on b7, it's not a very good bishop with this pawn on d5. So there's ideas like this. So I went bishop d7. He went bishop back. Bishop has sort of done its uh, purpose. I went g6. Now all his pieces are so active um, that I felt I had to. He kicked out my best piece. He plays this bishop on c3. Now, of course, this is an extremely dangerous position for me because not only are my pieces a bit passive and I have less space, but also on the king side, there's something about my structure. Like there's something I really have to fear. What is that? Dark squares? The dark squares, exactly, right? Because I've put everything here like a snake and I'm I'm in serious trouble. So I go rook here and he goes knight g4. And already my dark squares are so weak that he's threatening uh he's threatening checkmate. Yeah. Uh so somebody is saying in the chat, I don't know if they're a late arrival, white is playing really well this game. <laughs> <laughs> and then the, they just said, oh, it's Magnus, question mark. Yeah, it's Magnus. 
it is indeed Magnus, and Magnus just basically crushed me like a bug in this game, right? But he is the world champion, so... He is the world champion. I thought, um, though, that the master of the crypt would be able to really challenge the world champion, but uh, perhaps next game. Yeah, well, actually, every time I, I play Magnus in, in recent memory, I get crushed, so there is no next game. Uh, spoiler alert. Oh. But... Um, if I ever win, uh, you'll be one of the first people to uh, to know. So, anyway, in this game, the key thing is not you know how am I going to beat Magnus uh, next game. I you know no guarantees there, of course. Um, no matter how well I play the opening, but let me try and at least figure this one out. Bishop c4. Obviously, I don't want to play e6 ever again. But I, I'd love to put my bishop on f on f5 or on g4. But the problem is this damn queen b3 move. So, if I'm now analyzing this position, uh, I can use an engine, I can use a database. By the way, this um, Coaches platform, for those of you who are, who are not aware, you guys can join the waitlist of this Coaches platform if you uh, like the look of it, um, if you're either a student or, or a coach. And what's cool about this platform is that it has an integrated uh, engine and also an integrated database. And as a result, you can actually, you know, do all of this work within one platform. Traditionally, you would do it, you know, with a mixture of chess programs like Chessbase and then online sites, etc. But anyway, um, let's assume that you know you're you're able to work with an engine, you're able to work uh, with the um, with the Openings Explorer. So you mess around with this position, you try to come up with a solution uh, to this problem of developing your bishop. So how how might you go about that? Okay, so you're asking me, or you're asking Chet? Uh, no, I'm asking you. Whenever. All right. So I I know I can't really play uh, Bishop F, F5, and I I don't want to play E6. So first thing I would I would do uh, is I would say, okay, this Bishop uh, can I can I force it to maybe to move and. I started looking like at any variations I could find where I could uh, get this uh, bishop just basically to to stop annoying me. So, for instance, uh, any variation would be like uh, b4, and if he, if he drops the bishop back to maintain the attack on the uh, weak. Oh yeah, can I draw arrows? I'll try. Uh, if, yes, if... if you press the little pen thing, should work right. for you. I press the pin. Okay, yeah. So if he drops, if if I go like here and he drops the bishop back to maintain. Okay, I'm really. Perhaps that's why I'm losing. Okay, really bad at this. So if he, he if he tries to um, drop the bishop back here to maintain the the pressure here, well then of course the queen can't come there. So that's the first sort of variation I would see, and then I will probably try to, because then, I would think okay, how about maybe this diagonal towards the king is that is that going to be a problem and then because i'm not a super strong chess player i would say no nah, probably not because i have all this uh stuff going on here but maybe and then i would ask my coach on coaches the uh, great master of the crypt uh what's wrong with this okay so e excellent right so your first idea would be this move b5 here yeah um the point being that now you're hoping that you can develop like this. Yeah. Uh, the price to pay of this is that this pawn here becomes uh, like that's the biggest price to pay. It becomes a, quite a big weakness. And when you wait, think wait, which pawn? Which pawn? The pawn on c6. All right. This guy. Yes, I, I had actually been highlighting it. You didn't see the circle around the, the c6 pawn. Mm, did not. Uh, okay. So let me know if, can you see this? Yes, I can. Okay, perfect. Oh, that's strange. Um, okay, so the, this pawn on c6 uh, is now a weakness. And if you think about it, um, why in these structures uh, has one central square that is, is a very, very nice square for a particular piece? Magnus actually did this in his game against me. What's the square in the center where white really is going to establish a piece? So if I could just take any piece and pick it up and just drop it anywhere, 
particularly in this position, I would take uh, the knight and drop it on, on e5. Excellent. Yeah, you take the knight. And that's if you could do anything. But in fact, like, that's not so difficult. To not execute. two moves. Exactly, right? So you're doing knight f3, you're doing knight e5, and then there's problems here on f7 yeah. and on c6. Yeah. So immediately for me, like without getting into variations, like intuitively, I'm pretty concerned about this pawn on c6. Mm -hmm. Because first of all, there's these ideas. There might even be some queen f3 ideas. Mm. There might even be some a4 ideas to punish this potential overextended pawn here mm -hmm. on b5. And another thing that I know about the Karo Khan from like studying the typical plans, the typical ideas, is that uh, black, white here, if we talk about, forget about opening theory, just talk about structure. White's structural edge, structure, space, we can kind of join them in this case. White's edge is what here? I mean, if you just think about structure. So his, like, his, you have his... no bad bishops. You have a uh, strong pawn chain in the center. That's hard to challenge. Yes. Uh, but if we, yeah, so just limiting ourselves just to the pawns. Yeah. Which one is White's, let's say, best pawn here? The best pawn? The best pawn for White that Black would really like to undermine. Okay, so you mean D4? Exactly. D4, right, gives White an edge. Yeah. It gives white a space advantage here. Yeah, 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 I sure. mean, if, if I could just get rid, let's say, of this pawn for this pawn. Yeah, it would be awesome. Yeah, I'd be pretty happy. Similar if I could get rid of this pawn for this pawn. And it so would very be even often, better, maybe. Exactly. Very often, what black does is he goes for c5, tries to get rid of that pawn. Mm -hmm. But the problem, if you do that, is your b5 pawn might actually be quite weak because you push that and then you want to follow on with this plan. So. Mm -hmm intuitively the idea of b5 doesn't appeal to me too much because you might be overextended with the pawn on b5 c6 might be a weakness it might be difficult to execute your typical plans of caro Khan plans with c5 and also if white ever gets in his typical plans of a knight on e5 then it's going to be even more problems for you potentially so because of all of this let's say b5 is not the most attractive move yeah also it's just a kind of move like overextending the pawns to, to solve some problems i lost a lot of games especially when i just started chess by overextending the pawns and then opening up some terrible diagonal towards my king or like it all came became too loose so you're saying but you're saying there is a way though yeah there, there is a, a way here of, couple of ways so I'm, I'm actually just while you think about it i'm just going to read a little bit catch up with the chat uh, mm -hmm. Some people are making some suggestions, like uh, somebody says queen b6 uh, as one option. Very interesting uh, idea, just getting ready to meet queen b3. Uh, who else is giving suggestions? Uh, knight d5 is also being given as, as an option. I was uh, just looking at that. Yeah, it's exactly. hard to get rid of that knight, knight maybe. Uh, what else? So knight d5, queen b6. These are the two main ones that are jumping out at me. Some people are suggesting bishop f5. They may have arrived quite recently. The problem with bishop f5 is the most natural move in the position, but it runs into... Exactly. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. uh, what Hune is outlining here, queen b3 with a double attack on b7 and f7. So therefore we need to figure this one out. Yeah, that we're basically trying to solve for anybody just who just joined us. We're basically trying to to solve how to get this bishop out without just running into this. And I was suggesting b5 doesn't work, yeah. or maybe if it does, or it's not the best. It's That's not the best. It's it's not a very good move. And somebody said that one. I uh, looked at that one and. I'm kind of out of ideas, actually. I don't know, like, because you don't want to, you don't want to do this. Excuse me. You don't want to do this because probably if you just capture that, I'm just left with this. That's just terrible. Yeah. Uh, and, and if you do this, doesn't re, I don't see how that's going to work. Um, so, so, okay, so 
there's been some great suggestions uh, in terms of queen b6, b5. Uh, another idea that I've seen in the chat is e5. By the way, I want to sort of uh, compliment people on, on spotting the fact that uh, black can actually uh, temporarily give up a pawn like this. Uh, Rune, a little test. What happens if taking the pawn on e5? I mean, why doesn't white just end up a clean pawn to the good? Mm, maybe um, maybe you exchange queens and then you play knight. Uh, then you play something like, uh, can I draw? Play something like like this yeah. idea, Excellent. like this. Excellent. Yeah. Let me let me go ahead and uh, that's exactly right. The point is this typical motif here, where suddenly f two and e five are both hit. This would be a success for black, but black doesn't have to. Uh, uh, white white doesn't have to agree to that. Uh, white can try to say, well, this move e five, maybe it's not so wise if I just continue development. Like I'm you know I'm using I'm not using an engine here just for a more human. Uh, perspective, but here, for example, white might even just castle and say, "Okay, oh yeah, uh, you know that sound that looks that looks uh, really scary." Yeah, I mean, you're you're down a you're up a pawn, but wait a second, that pawn that you wanted on e7 yeah. that you maybe wanted to blunt my bishop, that's gone. Yeah, and you know, one sample line of of how quickly things might get very ugly is here, white to play. Uh, what's the move? I, I think the most convincing move here. By far. Oh, uh, so one thing you could do. Can I move this? Yeah. So exactly. that's real big problem. Game over. Exactly. Well spotted. Um, very quickly spotted. The point is, if black now black is forced to capture this bishop, and then goodbye to the to queen. the queen. Yeah. Very nice. So the the point anyway is, all of these moves kind of run into problems. And actually, this highlights one of the very important things about this type of analytical work that I keep stressing to my students. Do this work, test, like come up with theories as to like how you might play. So here's like one idea. Here's another idea. Here's another idea. And then when the computer is screaming in your face telling you that's stupid, right? The computer will always tell you that's a stupid move. That's a good move. But it'll never tell you why, right? So as, a, as somebody who wants to analyze their own games just and improve by themselves, just try and always figure out the why. The computer will tell you what. What is the best move? What, like, what is the evaluation, et cetera? It'll never tell you why. But you can use the computer to, to, to figure it out slowly but surely. And after a while, what happens is you actually end up like building a big mental database of loads of different little ideas ideas specific to your opening, but also ideas like tactical motifs and patterns. So for example, here in what we've done so far, we've strengthened our awareness of this pattern, mm -hmm. which might come up, might come up in other openings that isn't the Karo Khan, you know, Queen B3 hitting double attack on B7 and X7. Another pattern that we saw is if E5 takes, takes, takes. This one you got very quickly, my guess is because you were already familiar with the pattern, right? You've seen it before, and on some level, it it struck a chord. Would that be fair to say? I think it's more fair fair to say that I'm just really good at chess. But no, probably probably like at least at least the idea of exchanging queens and then the fork on uh, on on if if two is yeah yeah. I think I it's, lost it's... a lot of games like that when I just started out. Exactly. So by, by working on your openings like this, I think you get a lot more out of it than if you, you know, just work from a book and you try and like just read, oh, the author says that I should play this move on move 12, but you don't really understand the why and you don't really, you've never really looked at the alternatives. Mm. Okay, so, but let's go back um, and let's actually uh, give you a hint because nobody that I've seen has actually, oh, I am homeless on Wi-Fi. Hello, Mr. I'm homeless on Wi-Fi actually comes up with uh, with the main line. And he even, you know, he's, he's, he brings a touch of arrogance to the table. He says, nobody suggested the main line yet, question mark, smiley face, right? I mean, the guy, <laughs> the guy knows he's got the goods here. So hello to I am homeless on Wi-Fi. I'm going to give you a clue, Hone. Uh, if, I, if you played bishop f5 and I played queen b3, if you had two moves here, what might you play? Like, what, what are two moves that you'd like to deal with the, the double threat here? 
Okay, so I can play two moves, so I can play two defensive moves. No, don't, don't, don't do this to me. <laughs> play like that. Okay, so you could play e6 and b6. Absolutely. Well, I really want to play e6 at least. A hundred percent, right? So you'll start with e6, and then I'll, you know, play some silly move. Yeah. And now you could go b6, but remember what we said about the problem of advancing this pawn. Yeah. Which yeah, is yeah, sure, sure, sure. This sure. weakness. Okay, so maybe I play like that. Excellent. Uh, okay, so yeah. this is probably your ideal setup. Therefore, let's move on to chapter two, solution to opening situation number one. In this position here. Can we just uh, flip the board? Yes, yeah. absolutely. In this position, I write a relatively rare way to play. What is the annoying point behind the, the way of playing for white? We already figured this out. And the move that I, I realized is probably best is to move queen c7 here. Okay. Which makes sense. Now we're preparing what move? Yeah, well, you are pre But, uh, okay, so can I just ask? So, because to me, we are just still working on this. But I don't exactly see how, let's say, uh, queen b3. Yeah. Then how... I guess we can defend like this. But I still don't see... Basically, you don't see, if, I, if I'm understanding you correctly, you don't see how after queen b3, excuse me, how after queen b3, we're going to be able to get our magical setup because if we go bishop f5 here, he yeah, 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 exactly. So we're going to have to play e6 anyway. So everything I've told you is a lie, Hune, and now you're feeling serious issues that <laughs> maybe you trace back to childhood. Yeah, yeah, this is, yeah, this is your, I, this is terrible. I thought that the right. master of the crypt would do well by me, but no, this can't be. There has to be a way. But in fact, this is. The move queen c7 is is sort of very good at the level one. I mean, it, we're almost at level one, or maybe we're at level two uh, at this point, or level three, I don't know. But it's like, okay, now we have an idea with queen c7, which is we want to go bishop f5, etc. And that's like, when I say level one, I mean, like, that's kind of relatively straightforward to uh, understand but now we have like the next level which is after queen b3 why is the computer telling us that the move queen c7 is actually a good move and why are strong players playing this when in the end we still have to play the bloody e6 move right so it's like what have we achieved so clearly the difference between this and playing the automatic e6 is that this position has in included two moves two extra moves one from each side. What are those moves? So my question is, for example, after bishop c4, I can go e6 immediately. I can get this position. Or oh, I can okay, go so here. What, okay, I, I think I get this. it. So so are you arguing, or like is main line theory arguing that by playing uh, queen c7, you sort of force Magnus to play uh, queen b3, because otherwise his his th setup doesn't make any sense. And then when you play e6, then his queen is not really that good, and your queen is maybe even a little better than it was on its original square. Something like that. Absolutely, exactly correct. That's that's actually exactly it. The point is the queen on c7. Wait, wait a second. Actually... Wait, wait a second. <laughs> I deserve to wear these now. Let me tell you, Luna, I've been giving uh, quite a lot of lessons over the years, and this is the first time that uh, any student puts on sunglasses mid-lesson. Uh, mid so. But I feel I earned it. But that was uh, some really good analysis, wasn't it? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna disagree with you on, on basically on anything uh, non test related. Um, so yeah, so basically, uh, the queen on c7, very useful. Bishop can come to d6, etc. The queen on b3, on the other hand, if you actually, if we pop back to the Magnus game, where did Magnus put his queen? He went to e2, right? Mm -hmm. he, didn't, he didn't bother any queen b3 stuff. The queen on e2 is fantastic here. Mm -hmm. On the e-file, closer to the king side. Can I up some squares like these? Can support the knight, supports the bishop here, but doesn't sort of get in the way. So the position is is a little bit better, uh, whereas here I actually went queen c7 anyway. So you see the point, right? It's like yeah. queen, my queen is probably going to land on c7 anyway. It's queen mm. not so much on b3. 
So that's the first little idea. And by actually uh, studying this, you're like thinking to yourself, suddenly you, you start to be like more aware of these nuances, these subtleties. It's like the computer tells you, wait a sec, this position is actually okay with E6, but the previous position with E6 was bad for black. And then you got to figure out exactly what you did, which is uh, the queen on B3, the queen on C7, and then truly try to really understand that. So maybe a question I would ask myself is, so when I didn't get what I really wanted, which was the bishop outside the pawn chain, but still apparently this is better than what is the difference? And the difference here is the queens. And then apparently the position of the queens are better for me in this position and then I should work my way backwards as to why that is. Something like that? Yeah, something like that. I mean, the way that I would continue it is I wouldn't like say, okay, at this point I already know this position for sure is 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 better because the engine is telling me like try and actually continue the position until you're like sure right mm -hmm. so for example i continued it for a bit i said okay knight f3 uh h6 makes sense stopping bishop g5 ideas castle bishop d6 rookie one all the moves made sense to me they were kind of like the top engine moves for both sides knight e5 so this is the plan that we've already seen planting the knight on e5 and now in terms of how to develop this bishop on c8 it went b6 here another typical idea and bishop b7 and i looked at this position and thought i'm much happier with his queen on b3 than if this queen was on e2 mm -hmm. yeah much happier uh and i also will have this c5 break down the line so my whole uh, my bishop will actually become quite active and my whole position is pretty safe here pretty comfortable so um that was sort of the the, the solution and just to to focus on these tactical motifs tactical ideas there's a there's a well-known trap in the Karo Khan, we're in this position, right? So we're going back here. Instead of queen b3, uh, white here could play a developing move like knight f3. And there's a trap in the Karo Khan that if, for example, in this position, uh, we had something like bishop g4, knight f3, and let's say, I don't know, we play some silly move like rook here. White to play, uh, does anybody know uh, what is a really, really strong continuation here? Uh, Hune, I'll give you a chance also to, to work it out. Oh, but that's... I see this all the time in the Budapest when people don't play a main line in, in Budapest because you can sacrifice and you can win the bishop, right? Okay, very good. Okay, so what's your move? I uh, Can I draw? I can. I, I take here, when you recapture, I have a check and I'm picking up this because it is only defended once. Exactly, very powerful. And sometimes that, that's exactly it. I'll just show that for, for the viewers. Takes, takes, and 95 check. And the point is this bishop on g4 is falling. So you win a pawn and the king is shattered. Everything is, is gone there. But the other very powerful idea is 95. Yeah. Sometimes that also works. Because and if that's, you take yeah. the queen, sometimes that can actually be an extra, an extra uh, uh, piece and not just a pawn, because if I go bishop h5 to try to defend the pawn like this and defend against the threat, what do you what do you do here, Mr. Hune? Well, I just capture. A classy move, exactly. Now the point is if knight takes queen. You still have the, you're still checkmate. It's still checkmate here on f7. So very nice. So there are some ideas, but we see that none of these ideas actually work in our line with queen c7, knight f3. And so here we actually can play bishop g4 uh, because if white now goes for the same idea to win a piece, what exactly happens there? Uh, ex uh, excuse me, I just saw that for yeah. a second there. What's the question? Uh, if we now repeat the same idea yeah. as white, oh, okay, why doesn't but, it work? But, okay, but, so, but you have now queen here and... And so you're saying that this doesn't work. Uh, yes. This doesn't work. This does not work because? I don't know. You sacrifice like this? I don't see that working. Exactly. No, but it does work. because It does work. Take... Okay, yeah, yeah, it does work. Yeah, it works. Okay. In the end, black is currently up two pieces. White will get one of them back. Yeah. But that's, then he moves his light squared bishop. Yeah. And here you would capture like this or like this? Uh, 
you mean you mean would I capture the pawn on f6? Okay, or... yeah, but it's whose move is it? It's black to play. I would just oh okay, yeah, okay, of, oh, okay. Then you just save the bishop, all right? Yeah. Sorry. Exactly. Got so lost in the variations is... there. Uh, this is somebody, by the way, is asking the the real questions. Is the guy you're talking to Danish? I am. <laughs> all right. I'm proud. I'm proud of it, it sounds, by the way you answer the question. Oh, yeah. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Gotta be. Proud Viking blood. Are yeah. Danes uh, a proud proud uh, people in general? Well, we've had... Uh, it, it depends, like, how you, how you view it. Like, it, when we are abroad, when you're anywhere else, and we uh, we somebody ask ask us if we're from Denmark. We go, yeah, we're like the best country in the world. We have universal healthcare. Like everything is just awesome. If you come here and ask us how do you feel about Denmark, we just oh, I don't like it. It's basically just a lot of crap, and the politicians are all terrible, and the weather is terrible. So if we are at home, we're really moany and complainy. And if we are abroad, we're just like so proud of everything and we're just we just support everything the politicians do but uh, but uh, yeah so we are just sort of schizophrenic about like that all right well i have no further questions <laughs> but, but that was really interesting actually uh there was a bit of chaos in the back uh, on my end uh, just at the beginning but it's interesting that 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 uh, contrast um Let's let's uh, yeah. So let's go let's go back to this position. So now, basically, what I discovered was, uh, in the future, I'll go queen c7, and my first question was, what if white develops normally with knight f3? Aha! I have bishop g4. That's a good way of completing my development. The biggest question is, what about this position after queen b3 e6? Why is this better? And then I figured out, ah, the inclusion of the queen position here is in black's favor, so I can get a good position this way. I even did one more question, which is what do you do after knight e2, trying to, the idea behind this development is trying to avoid the pin, because then you'll have f3, mm -hmm. and also uh, getting bishop f4, gaining a tempo on my queen. So it's like, okay, this one also uh, sucks. And I'll very quickly, just for the sake, interest of time, I'll actually show the, uh, the solution I, I decided was quite comfortable, which is to go e6 anyway. Mm -hmm. And so if the, you know, if level one was this whole like queen b3 idea and then level two was understanding why after queen b3 e6, we were actually still uh, an improved version with the queens here, then level three would be understanding why this position here is somehow acceptable for black. Because in this case, white has kept his queen on d1. So that that should be an achievement. And so white has kept his queen on d1 where he wants it and our bishop on c8 behind the pawn chain. And yet, I'm still saying to you, Rune, that this position is okay for black. And the, the explanation, just for the interest of time, the explanation is that here, in a position like this, white actually did have to make one concession. His major concession wasn't putting the queen on b3, but there was one piece of his that didn't go to the square he'd liked. What was that piece? Do you recall? Oh, so the knight here, and now exactly. the knight knight is a far away from landing on uh, landing here. Exactly, exactly. The knight went to e two when it wanted to go to f three and then to e five. So yeah, it's true. Black got this big achievement of keeping our bishop locked in for a bit, but we also or white rather, but we also got an achievement. And so that's you know level maybe that's also level two. Today. Maybe I should stop the level talk because I think I'm confusing even myself. But anyway, <laughs> we, we move on. Okay? Um, opening situation number two. Okay. This one was against uh, Daniel Naroditsky. Anybody know Mr. Naroditsky? Or Rune, do you know Naroditsky? I do. Yeah, okay. I do. So, I, I met him at uh, Politikenkopf in Denmark. Ah, you know him personally. Okay. Oh, I don't, so, know, I don't know him. I just We just met and just I said, well... You're playing really well and he was like i know <laughs> did he actually say that no nah, i can't remember i uh, he, he seemed like a pleasant enough guy hmm. so he's I, I don't know him personally but he's super strong like 2600 plus very strong blitz player etc so we played this game in um 
an unnamed site uh, uh, competitive uh, tournament. And um, and it, once again, let me flip it uh, from the board. Once again, I play my Carol Khan, and once again, I get caught out theory-wise. So the guy goes queen f3. Looks like a, a beginner's move, right? Queen, queen for f3. Yeah. Um, so I say, let me try and punish this move by playing the move d4. Yeah. And just hitting his knight on c3 immediately. But then, instead of moving his knight, he actually plays the move bishop c4. Instantly. That's now annoying. Then, yeah, I'm getting a little bit concerned because, you know, he's threatening to come crashing down on f7. And at this point, it's more like poker than like chess. I'm not even going to calculate taking on c3. I'm just going to believe this guy. He's 2600 plus. He's playing this instantly. It's obvious that he's not bluffing. Right? So I'm just, I'm going to keep on going. So I play knight f6, but the dude still doesn't move the damn knight. He goes e5. Yeah. So at this point, I take his knight, and he takes my knight. And now I have a decision what to do. So what, what would you do here? Or what would the, the chat do? Well, I think my intuition says to just sort of break the rule and capture away from the center. I don't really know... Why? Maybe it's just because I don't want to compromise the structure for castling because I feel I'm under pressure. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe I would throw in a check with the pawn first, but I like pawn captures here first. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Maybe I would do that. Uh, I would I would calculate that at least. Uh, and I like intuitively I would like this because I'm not sure where my king is going after this. Okay. So I think okay. basically here, and is he? I don't know. You tell me. Yeah. So well, I mean, actually, your 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 instinct is 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 pretty good here in terms of um, in terms of the options you're considering in this. Um, I also like the fact that you didn't immediately jump into this mm. idea of capturing this pawn because you win a pawn this way, uh, but you'd have to be a bit of a, a bit of a patser, a bit of a fish, to to think that it's a good idea to uh, grab a pawn and then have to weather this giant attack, right? Yeah. Especially against such a tactically talented, a tactically gifted player as Naroditsky. So of course, this is exactly what this particular patser did in the game. <laughs> And uh, I was very lucky to, to survive. He went wrong. Um, he actually went wrong here. He, he probably didn't have so much analysis because he, he was probably thinking you'd have to be so foolish to capture this pawn that I won't look at it too deeply. Uh, and you are correct that capturing this pawn on f6, I think taking with the e pawn is better than the g pawn overall because it kind of beefs up your king side uh, for when you castle here. If you take with the g pawn, it's going to be very difficult for you to find like a safe haven for your king. Um, at least on the king side. So so he takes f6 with the sensible move here. But what I actually did is I took here on d2. Then he played bishop takes. I took here. And only when he castled queenside did it dawn on me, shit, I, I, you know, I need a few more tempi here. Or I'm dead. Um, I can't develop. So I tried my best. I went knight d7. And here, thankfully, he made a big mistake. He went queen b3. The same idea that we saw the last time, but in this case, after knight e5 here, I was able to just about hang on to everything, hanging on to f7, threatening to take his bishop, and the lucky thing for me is that he doesn't actually have any especially dangerous discovered discoveries. He went bishop b4, but I have this clever move, queen b6, and the point is, when he takes, I get to swap the queens off, and I emerge in a queenless position up a pawn and actually only black is better so that that's the, the way the game went he later tricked me later tricked me and equalized and then it ended up in a in a in a draw um but my question for you Rune, is here is white how should white have continued and and same for the chat what do you guys uh what do you guys think would be the best move here for white well Really throwing me on the diva end here, huh? I mean, you have so much pressure. 
You have so much pressure. The kid, uh, master of the crypt, Alex has that power. So uh, if you are screaming the solution at me, then I unfortunately am not able to, to see it. So I, I find it hard to actually reach F7 because maybe just like this. It's, uh, I find that a little bit hard. We have all these checks, I'd like to think about those, but as long as we can block them easily, then probably, also because I really want to play this, so I can castle, and if I castle, I feel I'm pretty good, pretty safe. Um, then, of course, there are ideas of sacrificing. Um, not sure if we achieve anything really. So w would we have a good move with the queen here? Don't really see like a knockout blow there. So then of course we could also just try something like this with an idea of going here and just say, I don't even need a knockout blow. I just, I'll just pile on the pressure because I can attack faster than you can defend. Um, oh, Alex, you're back. I am indeed back. Can you hear me okay? Absolutely. I just, I hear that sweet baritone of your manly voice in my headphones very nicely. And I feel safe and secure in the knowledge that you will provide the solution that I failed to find. You know, you actually uh, complimented me in this exact same fashion uh, before we went live. And I said to you, uh, I would prefer if you reserved that compliment, saved it for the actual stream. And, uh, and you delivered. So I did. I, I wrote it down on a, on a piece of uh, toilet paper here, which, uh, and that's just to show off my wealth in these Corona times that I use uh, <laughs> toilet paper for notes. Uh, but yeah, I delivered it. I waited for you to get back. Uh, Appreciate it. Did the chat find the solution? So I, un unfortunately, I can't see the chat. Uh, so yeah, so some people are, one person at least found the, the best move, but there's a lot of different possibility being thrown in, like knight h3 is one move that I've seen, knight a3, rook e, no, knight, no, knight h3, rook e1 check. Yeah. Uh, these are two moves suggested. Queen g3 has been suggested. Um, what else has been suggested? That's about it as far as I can see. Uh, queen e3 check as well has been suggested. Um, so those are the moves. Are any of those the one that you consider to be best? Uh, well, I looked. I looked at. Um, I looked at knight here for coming here. I looked at here. I briefly looked at uh, capturing here, but I couldn't find a knockout blow that really felt like it justified giving up a piece. Um, tried to find somewhere interesting to go with the the, the bishop. Uh, yeah. to to f four also has been suggested yeah to to sort of uh, just make this more active um, oh uh, and uh, but I didn't I, I I was first I was looking for knockout blows right I was looking for okay sack here make give a check here then this checkmate or win a piece or something I couldn't find anything um, yeah. looked at this thought. Well, actually, that's pretty good, maybe. Because well, because no, you can't Queen defend Queen like this. Is the move that he played, actually. Okay, Queen it is. Oh yeah, and and, and you yeah yeah, yeah 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 and and you had because of course this defense yeah I just forgot for a second yeah, so but I I guess I can forgive myself if a twenty six hundred grandmaster can miss that so. Yeah, I I this this is the stuff that I've been considering, and I didn't find anything too convincing. Yeah, so it's a really tough it's a really tough position in the sense that there are so many options and I, I think Naraditsky actually did think for a little bit and then went wrong here. So it's a, as you say, when a twenty six hundred plus gets it wrong, uh, you know, uh, the the rest of us mortals sort of are feeling okay, at least uh, don't have to feel like crap, yeah, for, mm. <laughs> for getting it wrong. Um, but in fact, the, the most powerful move here, actually, if you sort of work through. The concrete variations of all of them we won't for for the sake of time okay but i have one actually, last suggestion yeah it's just insane but i i just wanted to say that i thought about this oh, uh cool. Cool concept yeah 
uh, if it happens to be the right one, then I wanted to say that I did thought about it, did think about it. It's on the books, yeah. But it doesn't seem to... I think it doesn't work after Bishop no, E7. No, yeah. Probably um, not. When I analyze this position, the, the move that is clearly the most upsetting here for, I think, for uh, Black, a few people in the chat actually got it right, is literally to prevent Black's threat. And in this case, a lot of the time when you hear about threats, you think, oh, he wants you know checkmate on A1 or something crazy. Uh, but actually here, Black's threat is really simple. He just wants the humble Bishop E7. Right? Was yeah. the humble bishop e7 and then castle, and then at this point, if I can complete my development, you're dead. And so it turns out, you know, rook e1 check kind of helps with bishop e7. If you try and punish this, you can always do knight e5 and blunder rook takes e5. Probably I'm here without an engine, but I think c5 something like this should be fine. So, but it turns out the move queen g3 is super painful here. Oh, like, right. Now we can't. Now the threat of rookie one is huge, mm. and we and we just can't find a good way to develop. And if we have to throw in a move like g6, you know, we're gonna get fried, right? The queen is much better also on g3 now that we can't hit it with the knight, stuff like that. Black is in serious trouble. So, of course, you gotta go back to the lab after you, you know, you play a game like this. I drew the game, and I even got a better position out of the opening, but that wasn't the point. The point was. If my opponent had played very well from the way that I played, I would have been bust, busted, completely busted. So what do I do if somebody does the same thing again uh, in the future? And so it turns out, looking at it, that all of this is OK. After allowing all of this is OK, and I could actually take uh, the piece. But my big mistake was that in this position, I shouldn't have grabbed the second pawn. So mm. instead, I should capture with the e pawn, and after takes, I can go knight d7. And the difference is, if he now goes for these kind of plans, I haven't given him that extra tempo, you know, with the bishop being mm. here on d2. So he doesn't have queenside castle, and I can just about now I, I can meet this queen g3 idea, uh, which is the same one. He wants to prevent me from developing the bishop. But I can find one creative solution. So the, the only thing I want you from this position, not focus on any more details, try and solve how to how to you know complete development as black, how to get that bishop out and castle short. How do we do this? So hello to everyone in the chat. While Rune has to solve this problem, you guys can also solve it if you would like. Um, hope you guys are enjoying uh, enjoying this format, by the way, if you guys um, have any feedback or any suggestions, anything like that. Um, and that's great. Okay, I'm thinking about stuff like okay, this may be a little bit like hope, hope chess, but I'm thinking like here, maybe here, uh, and then here, because I'm threatening something here. Really interesting idea, actually. That's a super interesting idea. I, I hadn't considered it. Uh, which sort of reveals that it isn't, it isn't the main yeah. option. But I like, I really like this this creativity here. Bishop G four, uh, hoping for you know H three and then a, a maniacal cackle uh, while you <laughs> deliver mate on D one, beating um, Naroditsky. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, but you know, it it kind of makes sense because if he does something like F three, for example, now you know you you argue that you've provoke the weak move and then maybe you could even drop the bishop here and put the bishop on g6 actually it's very very interesting um perhaps though the simplest path here is you just want to basically uh the simplest way of dealing with this thread on g7 maybe the simplest is actually to go g6 uh but this is not a move we want to play can you explain to me why um Well, fincheturing the bishop here, okay, I'll just go off the top of my head. Fincheturing the bishop here uh, kind of only makes sense if I at some point play this. Currently, I can't because it hangs the knight. Uh, and that's as far as my analysis goes, really. Yeah, 
And, and also think about the Fianchettoed bishop. Where, where is the, the king's bishop on g7? What diagonal does it exert influence on mainly, right? It's not right. this one, right? No, it's this one, yeah. Exactly, right? But what's, what feature of the white position tells you maybe the bishop... Oh, yeah, of course, seven? these these two. Exactly, right? So Biting the, on granite or what, uh, how the process is. Biting on to granite, say. as they say, exactly. Yeah. So you probably don't want that. On top of that, actually, the white queen is on g3. Nice feature of the position, meaning you'd actually really like to put your bishop on which diagonal maybe well here develop with. exactly right so how can we how can we execute a plan like that right bishop d6 immediately fails to queen takes g7 um just give me a second here so getting rid of all these lines so Okay, we could do some we could do different stuff we could put the knight here just permanently shut out the pressure there uh, but it well it wouldn't be my first idea because the knight is kind of nice here it defends this one it's in the center um then uh i don't know why i am currently I am uh, homeless on Wi-Fi in the chat and Pizza Racer. Uh, they're talking about Radagast White. They're all talking about that move, Knight G6, uh, yeah. as well. Uh, so you're actually correct. It, it seems a bit unintuitive because you're thinking, oh, the knight is in the center. But keep one thing in mind. The knight, although in the center, is it completely stable? Or oh, no, you have this all, all the time. There is this. Exactly. So it's a central knight, but it's not a totally stable knight. And the other thing is, look at its most forward jumps. F3, sorry, I didn't mean that. F3, D3, C4, G4. Three of them are impossible. G4 is the only one that's possible, but it's not that attractive. Right? Mm -hmm. um, so the knight on E5, like optically, it looks amazing, but it, it's actually not such a big deal to reroute it. If you go to G6, on the other hand, the future jumps can become very attractive in tandem with bishop D6. Um, and importantly, it allows Black to solve his biggest problem in the position, which is he just wants to castle, mm -hmm. he wants to get away from the center while that open E and D files are just too dangerous. Mm -hmm. uh, so one thing that's nice about working with openings this way is you don't get this out of, the, out of an openings book, but by analyzing your games like this, what you learn is, you know, you learn little ideas. You pick up little ideas, like that's kind of an unusual idea in this position. But the knight, to tr like to do this, in the Karo can is an unusual idea. But you just picked up that pattern or that, you know, that maneuver. And so it's very nice from that perspective. And let me show you the final, final interesting discovery in this position is that although D takes C3 is very close to equality, here's an idea, and I, maybe I shouldn't say it because it's, it's not something that I've gotten to play in a game yet, but here is a fantastic idea discovered in the analysis. Crazy move, knight d7. That it's is like it baller. No sense, you know? It's like, okay, you know what? I won't move my knight. I won't take your knight. I'll just develop my other knight, right? I mean, it's it's crazy. But the point is that after he takes f6, we're going to follow up with knight. Yeah, 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 yeah. And we, we pick up the, the beast there on c4, right? So we pick this guy up. Now we're one apiece. And we don't care that he's going to drop this knight. Because we're gonna, he can take this one. Because we're gonna pick this one up, and the line continues something like this. And in the end, if you do a material count, what can you tell me about the material? Well, it's even. Are you sure? Oh no! So white is up a pawn. White is up a pawn, right? So white's up a pawn, but black actually has complete compensation. Can you guess why that might be? Well. I would prefer being black here probably because those yeah. bishops are just awesome and I have like all my pieces are doing something and like like white pieces aren't really doing anything and also like the extra pawn that white has is not like a huge pawn to me. I mean Exactly, yeah. This, like exactly. This pawn here is not huge. Yeah, you you basically nailed it. Like the structure, the bishop pair. I don't know. The one thing I'm not certain if you mentioned was the slight lead in development now that Black has, but that's but basically you yeah, you nailed you nailed the point about this position, which is that white uh it's better to be black if you're 
I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna stop uh, giving you any credit from now on, just to avoid your party trick. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you're gonna you're gonna go for the hat trick soon with this party trick. Um, okay, so yeah, from a human perspective, you prefer to be black here. Open position, bishop pair, more fun to to play as black. So again, we 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 sort of went back into the lab, and we came up with some new ideas. And here's the point, once again, to repeat it, is like, in the future, if I see a similar position like this, I might actually find moves like knight d7 in a similar-ish position. It doesn't have to be identical. Just like you found this knight g4, knight takes f2, knight takes e5 motif, here's like a more advanced idea. And we picked up on it. And I firmly believe that a lot of the strength of the top guys is they analyze their, their openings in depth and they like discover all these different patterns and ideas, more so than like remembering move by move. Mm -hmm. Okay, final one of my opening situations, and then we'll move on to your games. The very final one, and we'll go a little bit quick because the lesson is going to go on for only another half hour or so. Uh, so we'll go a little bit quicker. Basically, uh, this was a game against uh, Chess Warrior, uh, aka uh, Abdu Satarov. Do you know who Abdu Satarov is? Unfortunately, I cannot say that I do. Okay, basically he is a super young grandmaster. He's like 16 years old or something like this and 2630 or 2640 in rating. Uh, so he's a beast. Where's, where's he uh, from? He is, uh, people in the chat will know. Is he from Uzbekistan or something like this? I'm not certain. Uh, I think maybe Uzbekistani, um, but somebody in the chat will correct me if, uh, if not. So anyway, so we're playing again in this, uh, in this league match online and and he goes for bishop d5 and i go for uh, the so-called berlin defense so everything is normal here uh normally you might know this you might not normally they go d4 this is sort of the traditional thing but nowadays many people go with d1 knight d6 they take here all of this is theory and what i'll tell you about this position is that what i the move i was most familiar with is just d4 okay which is supernatural, uh, a very normal move. It's a supernatural and, move. Yeah, That's I tried impressive. to correct myself, but you punished me. Yeah, you were too quick. Um, and the point is, you know, I'm used to playing like this. Bishop f6, hit the rook, then knight f5, hit that pawn on, uh, on d4. Very often they do like this, and then I just go d5. And I get like this symmetrical, boring structure, and I try to make a draw in 80 moves because I'm a kind of exciting chess player, right? So uh, an exciting style. <laughs> Um, but of course, when you're playing, you know, a guy who's infinitely more talented than you are, then you're, uh, you know, he's, he's one of the, the, the biggest prospects in, in junior chess uh, in the world. So, you know, when you're facing someone like that, you've got the black pieces, you're happy with the draw. But Abdul Satarov had other plans in store for me, and he didn't allow me to get my usual tricks with this kind of boring symmetrical position. And he went knight c3. So I went on autopilot, I went bishop f6, and then he put the rook back. Then I thought to myself, oh shit, now if I go knight f5, because there's no pawn on d4, I'm not actually hitting the pawn. And if I go knight f5 now, he can actually go knight d5. Suddenly I lose my bishop on f6. That wasn't part of the plan. You know, suddenly I don't really have great squares. Like bishop g5 maybe is the only square, but you know, in the future he can go f4. Uh, I definitely am going to struggle to put the pawn on d5. If I go c6, then... Can't he go I f4 the, immediately? The bishop pair? Yeah, he might actually be able to go f4 immediately, exactly. So the situation was kind of lame. And uh, I realized, oh shit, he's going to go knight d5. So I went c6. And then he went d4. And then I went rook e8, trying to more or less play like similar to d4. And then I took took. And now I want to get in my move d5 and just play my same old boring position I've had hundreds of times and life is good. But what does he do to stop me from that? Do it himself, maybe? Exactly right. He goes d5 himself and, and he is playing this all instantly, you know, laughing, basically laughing at how much more he knows at age 15 uh, than I do twice his age. And so I say, okay, I can't go d5 myself, so I'll go d6, but I'm disgusted already. Objectively, the position isn't even that bad for black, but I'm just disgusted because I, I don't have a plan and I don't know just how bad my position is and my opponent's blitzing everything out. Yeah. So he goes bishop e3, I go bishop f5. He goes like this and 
I actually play queen d7, and after queen d2, trying to get my pieces out, not, you know, my knight here is, is really bad, so I just try and develop the knight and put it in the center with knight c7, and I'm thinking, yeah, life is good, I'm hitting this pawn. Uh, I'm not thinking life is good, but I'm thinking I'm surviving, and then I realized I actually just blundered hugely. So, Rune, what is the, uh, the move here? Uh, and anybody in the chat, why to play and basically win? Okay, so I, I don't know if this is just a, a win, uh, but you could have problems there. Uh, if Quickly you can see spotted, that. well spotted. Yes. Is that is that correct? Yeah, that's okay. that's correct. I mean, he went the other direction, which is a little bit cleaner to go d takes c six first, just okay. hit the queen, you know. Yeah. Um, but I think it's probably just the same thing. I'm, I'm not sure, but it just seems a bit simpler this way because there's no intermezzos to consider. And then yeah, queen takes d six, and then I can basically resign here because I'm I've lost the pawn, and the c six pawn is also falling. So I, I struggled on for a few moves, and he, you know, he just he just KO'd me here. Queen d7, uh, I got stuck over here, and I went queen f5 to save my rook. He just went knight e7, 26 moves, and I'm dead. Mm -hmm. So again, you got to go back to the drawing board and figure out how to fix these problems. So the first thing that I want to say about this position is I had an assumption that here I couldn't allow the loss of this bishop. So when I went back and I checked the database of player player games, I checked with the engine, I saw what the situation was, how the stronger players were handling this situation. Um, and I realized that here, this is sorry, this is the next chapter, that here in this position, after castle, knight c3, I realized that actually uh, so in the game I had played c6, but actually bishop f6 is not such a big deal. Rook e1 and then rook e8 and allowing this knight d5 winning my bishop. Because it turns out that this position here, like this, has been played by even players as strong as Anand, Vichy Anand here. Mm -hmm. The point is, yes, he can win your bishop. But first of all, no back rank mate. That was one thing that I was a bit concerned about in these positions when I was sort of seeing them from a distance. Because it's kind of weird that you don't have any back rank mate, right? Yeah. Um, it's unusual that a knight defends from d6. But the other thing is, actually, the, the white pieces, he may have the bishop pair. But on the other hand, for now, everything is not developed. And black has a very simple plan. Yeah. So it's kind of like, you know, two factors. On the one hand, you've got the bishop pair. That's good for white. But on the other, you've got like this easy development and greater piece activity that sort of dynamically balances the position, if that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, so this was one option that I now had if I ever faced it again. But ultimately, I settled for the main line, which is knight e8. This is how they handle knight c3. And white has one idea in this position. He goes knight d5. Uh, bishop goes to d6. I got to save the bishop. And then the rook goes back, and then we kick out the knight. And here's white's not obvious idea at all unless you've studied it he goes knight e3 and his intention is actually to go where with the knight so he's done this yeah and maybe he want? maybe like i would like to hit the bishop excellent uh, thinking i so i have oops that's too much i have this that also looks at this in combination with something like this okay and, or, yeah, and, and of course that, as you as you mentioned, hits the bishop, right? Yeah. So knight f5 yeah. is indeed actually the right move. Okay. Um, so I go bishop c7, anticipating knight f5, knight f5 anyway, and after d5, hitting the knight, why did white do all of this? Why why has white so far done this whole circuit? What is the what is the payoff? Because it looks like he just has to move his knight again. Um. So I was I was trying to um, I was trying to do something with this. Queen apparently, g4, yeah. But, but apparently in, maybe that's up. a hope chess. Um, so and I mean you can go back, but that's seems a little well, so White smart. has actually done all these acrobatics to claim the same static advantage that 
that he could get in the other variation, which is indeed the bishop pair. So how does white actually push through this advantage? Okay, so, so you mean you're just saying now just throw this check now? Throw in the check, exactly, right? You Go throw here, in this capture check, the bishop. You capture the bishop, and it turns out that chess players are collectively sick enough, right? They're, they're, they're degens to the point where they actually have developed this theory, which is insane, right? I mean, this is modern chess at a high level. White is literally doing this as one of the main lines in order to just get the bishop pair. That's how you know the thin the margins can be at the at the high levels. And also, this is also in accordance with the principle that I was taught to never move the same piece twice, unless Absolutely. you have a good reason. <laughs> <laughs> you need about five good reasons for this one, yeah. But 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 you've got them, right? It turns out chess nowadays is like way less dogmatic than before, right? Because computers don't don't care about uh, about generalities, right? They, no. they think in specifics. Um, so here, yeah, we're, we're, white is actually winning the bishop pair. And so I looked at this position, and at first I thought, eh, how good, how bad is this? And I compared it to the other one. But it turns out that white develops like this, and black has one really interesting plan. or Well, maybe has a couple, but one plan that was quite interesting to me was f5. And I saw that Karyakin himself had actually uh, played this like four or five times against the world's best, and he'd drawn every time. So I said, let me take a look at roughly how this position is played, approximately. Like, what are the ideas? Where are the pieces going to go? I can't remember the exact moves, but roughly where are the pieces going to go as, so that I don't get humiliated like I did in the previous game. And so with that, we go to the only situation where I actually got to uh, implement the theory in a Blitz game that I played in, um, in a, against the title player. Uh, online, and it was against an Iranian player called Amin Tabatabai. And it was actually, it was a, so it was, no, it was a one and a half minute aside game. So it was basically a bullet game. And we both here, uh, Amin is a very strong player, like 2600 plus Grandmaster. And so I was very happy that only a couple of days previously I had looked at this line. So it was all very fresh. So we both didn't blitz, we bulleted out this whole line. So there's an online game, and he's, he's just. He's knows his stuff, right? He's done the work. And suddenly we're here. And he goes G3. And I, I wasn't sure what is the specific move orders or what is whatever, but I knew that one of the ideas behind that five is just to throw the pawn to F4. So knight went here, queen here, and I sacrificed. Turned out it was actually wrong this particular moment. And he could have captured it and with some computer solution, got in a little bit of an advantage. But he played in more human way, like this, and in the end actually got himself into a pretty nasty position at some point, because I got this big central situation here. The point is, he cannot capture uh, an extra pawn here. Um, he cannot just take this pawn by, by liquidating, because in the end, what is the move that uh, Black has? Um... Wow, so you drew a billion arrows. So you're saying that this doesn't work. This doesn't yeah, work. Say, why can't you take this pawn? Because I can just go bishop takes, pawn takes, rook takes, rook takes, queen takes. And then your queen ends here. Correct. And then you have check and nastiness. Exactly right. Yeah, so you get completely crushed. So therefore, black suddenly is in a really good position because he's got all his pieces really well lined up. And do we really care about white's bishop pair here? Not so much, because clearly this knight in the center is worth uh, plenty. It's, it's plenty good to combat the, the bishop pair. So he went here and actually allowed f3. And uh, why can I not take this this free bishop? Well, because of mate. On by the way, con yes. Congrats by the way to everyone in the chat who got this f3 move as well. So uh, yeah, mate here. So h6. And then in the end, um, in the end, I was able to to break through with this initiative here on the uh, on the king side. He took he sacked this pawn in order to take this one, but the problem is that the G file now cannot be defended. The threats here on G one, and so the moral of the story is that the first game when I got crushed uh, in this one here, it wasn't just that I didn't know the theory. 
It was more than that. It was that I didn't really know how to approach the position at all. So I was un I was unconfident. I didn't have uh, ideas like already in my head floating around that could be helpful for finding the right plan, the right candidate moves. And so I very quickly lost the thread, went knight c7, blundered, got punished, lost one pawn, lost a second pawn, and resigned shortly after. That was sort of the story, the narrative of this game. But the second, the second game was different because actually, uh, although we both ran out of theory around the same time, we both ran out of theory around uh, here, I feel, somewhere around here. But um, can I, I, can I ask you one question yes, about this? Because what did you play here? Uh, so I went knight f6. Okay, can I ask you why? Because I was looking at this. Can you go back one move? Yeah. Why not this? Yeah, I mean, maybe maybe f4 is actually the better move against g3. Okay. Uh, the reason I went knight f6 is actually because um, I had... I had seen that this was sort of the so it was a very fast bullet game yeah and i had seen that this idea of knight on f6 usually follows up f5 so i just i think i was uh had that in my in my in mm -hmm. mind but perhaps f4 first is better um concrete analysis would be required mm -hmm. is there some bishop h3 with a tempo on this rook here uh who knows um so the, the thing is in the end though um, I had some ideas in terms of this, like F4 stuff, got a playable position and was quite confident. So it's it's not just about some opening theory to know, but it's about learning learning a lot of things along the way and having a lot of key plans and ideas. Uh, it's also about getting in a humble brag about this victory. After showing you too many of my defeats, I decided I just had to, I had to justify showing you a victory of mine. So. <laughs> well, that's okay. fair. That's fair. All right. So now we're going to get to, um, and perhaps I don't know if we're going to be able to do this again or not, but if we don't have time to, you know, analyze uh, enough of your games today, then, uh, then we, can, we can extend the analysis at a later stage, perhaps. Um, but the first game here that I wanted to show you was, uh, you played it against, uh, against the 1700. Uh, of course, you won the game. Uh, but there were some, <laughs> there were some, there were some mistakes uh, in the opening. Up to here, you played everything really well, uh, pretty much uh, perfect. And your opponent has gone a bit wrong. But after Bishop D three here, uh, your opponent played A six. And here, um, my first question: How should you play here? So people in the chat can also uh, speak about aggressively. It. Right? You should play aggressively. <laughs> That's not correct? Okay. Mm. Yeah, I mean, okay, it's partly. Well, I'm, I'm not sure it's correct at all, actually, to be honest. I don't think aggressively is the right word. Most people in the chat are getting it correct, uh, but you are not allowed to, to look. I can't. I, I don't even know where the chat would be. Excellent. So... How, how do you mean what, what kind of what kind of moves i should be looking at yeah i just i just want you to to tell me what i mean what you would play here i mean have a think about it for for a minute and Uh, in the meantime, I'll answer a question from the chat who asks, uh, Five Power Draw asks, what is the software that they are on? Uh, so this is actually the, the beta version of uh, Code Chess. Uh, there's a wait list available for any of you guys. You can go to codechess.live and uh, you can sign up to the wait list. Uh, this is um, basically intended to bring, uh, to bring online chess coaching to the next level. Uh, so it's a platform that is intended as a kind of uh, specialized all-in-one platform for um, for coaches and students uh, in general up until now if you want to be a coach or if you want to receive coaching there's you know a lot of moving parts to to the picture in terms of you know reaching out uh, by private message to to your coach uh, maybe you know getting some voiceover uh, like voice voice software like Skype uh, agreeing on a particular platform uh, for the games or a particular uh, program etc so this is Coach S aims to solve that problem by bringing everything into it. It's got like a calendar, it's got a cloud database, it's got a, a, a like you can uh, create student profiles, 
uh, you can create lesson profiles, lesson topics, etc. Um, so that's sort of the idea. If you're ever, if you've ever considered um, that coaching may be for you, um, uh, something that you want to either receive, or of course, if you're a coach uh, yourself, then this might be a this might be a good time to to join the waitlist and 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 uh, and see if it's a good fit. All right. I uh, I have changed my word now from pre uh, from aggressively to preemptively, because I was first I was looking at expanding in the center or sacrificing the G pawn or whatever, uh, but then I was thinking that it could be quite annoying uh, if my opponent sort of established something terrible something here, and then I was thinking that probably I have time to play this to just say yeah you can't play that because of the pin on from like the rooks are connected so i could just capture the rook um and then i i was looking at that and i was looking okay so i didn't really see actually after this i didn't really find a good move for for black and i was thinking okay then maybe after this i could continue with my overly aggressive patcher stuff how does that sound uh i'll give you an honest response if you promise me that when you put on your sunglasses you won't you won't impose your smirk upon me. <laughs> all right put the sunglasses but maintain a stoic expression okay can you promise me this i one? will i promise that was actually the perfect answer uh a4 is the correct move and uh, the explanation was also perfect i don't know I, it's okay <laughs> I feel there was a slight smirk at the end, but we'll accept it. All right. Um, yeah. So, so basically, you're you're absolutely right. One of the big mistakes that players that I find like uh, students make when it comes to space is they think I've got all this extra space now. I'm going to keep on pushing my pawns and just crush the enemy like a bug, right? I mean, that's sort of how they tend to think. Like I'm going to just throw the pawns right in their face. So usually, what we see is a uh, very often a little bit of a premature push. Whereas um, master level players, they're much more sure, like when is the right moment. And one of the things that they know, uh, one of the things that they realize is very often the best way to play a space advantage is to play prophylactically or preemptively to keep your space advantage. So don't let him grab space here in the center and maybe harass these pieces that are defending your center. You don't want that. Um, Instead, you play yeah prophylactically here with a4. Uh, in the game, you went b3. And of course, black uh, followed up with b5. And now, uh, the first mistake, I think, is kind of easy to understand, right? Let's go back to the levels thing, because I know you loved it when I spoke about level 1, level 2, level 3, level 10. Um, uh, everybody definitely understood what I was talking about. So we'll go back to the levels discussion. Um, Basically, after b3, b5, we could say level one conceptually, right? It's not difficult to understand that we could have prevented this. But here's a much more difficult one to understand. Bishop b2 turns out to also be quite a serious mistake. Uh, so any ideas as to why this move is a serious mistake? All right, so probably I was thinking that, that I'd like this... Uh that there are all these empty squares and those are good for the bishop and I will look here and then I will check mate on, on g7 yeah, apparently absolutely. that's that's apparently that's completely wrong um is so so why is this so it's not easy people are in the chat are also welcome to to sort of chime in why bishop b2 is uh, not a very precise move Let's say let's say he tries to force my hand a little bit here. Uh, he he goes here. Uh, I'll, let's say I go here. Now this is getting a little looser. Uh, does he is he? Uh, no immediate follow up that I can see. So uh, okay, maybe not. Maybe not this. Uh, Musmus says. Knight g4 to e3 could be an option. I really like the sort of attention to detail that this square now, uh, which is structurally weak because it has no pawn, pawn oh, cover. Oh, yeah. It's a bit dangerous. But also, uh, 
like so that's a nice point but actually a few people seem to be uh, very knowledgeable about these benoni decisions uh really like butil capiva's uh, response and uh, no fortnite please also with the same uh, idea uh basically what they're saying is uh what butil says after castling black can play c4 and what no fortnite please says is b6 to g1 diagonal is loose so what are they talking about this diagonal here is loose yeah and there might be some c4 ideas and this is sort of this they're they're on they're exactly on the right uh track so yeah, i can get killed really fast here yeah so for example if i go rookie eight here and i just say to you i just say to you uh i'm gonna try and create threats what is the most natural move here for white correct and now what is a powerful move that black has available here like that maybe so queen b6 is very interesting what's the threat uh you check when a bishop dominate the squares very good exactly now i'm gonna give you uh one one sort of piece of advice i don't know how often you use this or whatever but i always am very conscious in any position about stability mm -hmm. what what pieces if any or pawns do i have either undefended or poorly defended in this case you have one undefended piece this bishop is undefended this bishop exactly now also look at your king is it it's not weak it's not that weakly defended like oh weak. i see i think i see so you're going oh excuse me ah that's a very nice uh very nice way to let me find Boom! Excellent. And now that's level one. We're yeah. only at level one, Rune. Oh, okay. <laughs> only, only put. I got a way to solve my problems, though. Yeah. Bishop on b2, king on g1. I can deal with both threats at the same time with one move. What is the move? What? Okay, so you can. you. There is a way out of this position that prevents the immediate loss of material that, that the prevents immediate the condition. immediate loss of material wow okay so i have to it's not king h1 it's not king h1 uh and then there's there's just this and that's Correct. Pr probably exactly. sufficient so what you but now we're gonna you know we're not gonna give you such an easy life in no, this no. position here can you tell me what is the problem with rook f2 just try and keep it, try and work it out in your mind's eye. What is the problem with rook f2 at the end? Why doesn't it save the day? Um, okay, so you want me to, to, without moving the pieces, you want me to, uh, so castles, c5, takes, takes, check, rook f7, rook f2, um is there a way to hit that maybe just knight knight g4 you are a damn genius Rune. you got it in one <laughs> <laughs> uh, exactly right so c4 and the point is if you take take you take you give this check rook f2 knight g4 and well you've given black is down a pawn for now but he's clearly getting an exchange so he'll be a bit better Mm -hmm. okay now uh remember we we actually spotted opportunities uh in terms of you know potential tactical potential because of the instability of this bishop it's undefended and the exposed vulnerable nature of the king on mm -hmm. g1 so very important of course all tactical motifs so again this started with you trying to strengthen the way you played the opening but if you're doing this kind of work by yourself what it's actually teaching you is it's teaching you about middle game tactics as well motifs maneuvers it's teaching you chess overall uh which is the idea uh so your opponent didn't punish that by the way rookie eight would have been very strong and after castle c4 if you instead drop the bishop back can you tell me what black should do here okay so he, in this case, he's not winning uh, any material or anything too fancy, but he just gets a nice positional 
uh, edge here with one particular sequence. All right, so we have the weak diagonal. We have the weak square on E E three, um, and we have the tension with the pawns on B and C, and the undefended bishop on B two. And you are saying that there is a there's Here a nice the, positional the, advantage. Yeah, to you, be you can basically get as black. You can just get this long term positional asset. Um, okay, so how about I forget all of the stuff, the other stuff I was talking about, and then just put my knight there? Is that good? Uh, it's a nice move, and it's the right square for the knight. But we have something more powerful in this position, which is uh, which is b four. Just in the interest of time, I'll tell you the move. Uh, oh, wow, a lot of yeah. people in the chat got it, so congrats to them. Uh, what's the follow-up? What's the point? Okay, so I have to move the knight. Let's say I, I, he plays b4, I play yeah, knight I somewhere. Do, play knight somewhere, and you can push the other pawn, uh, and then I am... That looks... That's exactly it, right? It looks terrible. push back your pieces, and I get a protected pass pawn on c3. Yeah, Not and ideal. I can basically never dislodge. Exactly, not ideal. So, I mean, okay, the position, if you run it through an engine, I'll tell you it's not hopeless for white, but it's a little bit of an edge for, for black for, for no good reason. Mm -hmm. uh, so after bishop b2, your opponent instead went bishop b7, castle, rook c8 here, and you went e5. But this was maybe your next mistake, e5. It turns out that a prophylactic move, like king h1, uh, with this rerouting of this knight from c3 maybe to g3 first, Slowly but surely, you've got your central advantage, you're keeping it, you're getting your king off of this annoying diagonal, you're putting your knight on an even better square, you're activating the scope of your bishop, and then eventually you'll break through with e5. But right. you did what is very, very typical. Uh, we've all been there. I play like this against the Benoni as well. And it's you played e5. It's not actually a bad move. Um, it's just maybe not the most precise. Um, your opponent went knight g4, I think. He took took, and then he went knight g4. And actually, you you won a nice game uh, at some point here. Okay, got very messy. Um, you didn't get such a good position uh, out of it, as you can see here. But you did eventually uh, you did eventually win. Your opponent sacrificed an exchange, uh, maybe needlessly. And in the end, you had an extra exchange. You did convert it um, a few moves down the line here. Um, after h4, it seems like your opponent resigned. Uh, you've just got an attack and extra material. However, after e5 here, takes, takes, your opponent, he didn't go, uh, he didn't take the pawn. Um, instead, opting for knight g4. But actually, is taking the pawn so bad for your opponent here? Well... That's a loaded question if I ever heard one. Um, so probably not. Let's see, he takes. And so I am typical hacker uh, sort of fashion. I'm just looking at this and this and this and this and this and this. And I'm saying I have like laser beams pointing at the king. So just yeah, get the get the darn uh, filled floor knights out of the way so I can sack everything in mate and feel like uh, a, a genius and yeah. probably probably he can just take and then I don't have any knockout blows and I just sacrifice my center for no real compensation something like that uh, basically exactly right uh, once again uh, <laughs> Um, no, I mean, very good. Basically, the point is that, yes, he can take this pawn. Bishop takes. I think you used uh, some kind of uh, human intuition, psychology knowledge to assist you in, uh, in answering the question, right? You sort of tried to guess where I was spiritually when I was asking you this question. And Play the right. coach, not the board. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's really actually quite a common thing. Uh, basically, this position turns out white is okay, but he just, at the end of the day, gave up a pawn on, on the center, one of his central pawns for a flank pawn. So unless his attack turns out to be very strong, which it's strong enough to give him a decent position, but if his attack isn't so strong, he's actually suddenly got himself um, an extra pawn island. He's got this isolated pawn on e5, and he simplified the position 
and he's given up a central pawn for a lateral pawn. So it's very, very risky, and that's why the move king h1 would have been better. So even in this game where you could like pass it off and we'll just unconscious of time because we will be finishing in the next uh, six, seven minutes to show, even though uh, king h1, uh, sorry, even though you crushed your opponent, you won in 31 moves, your opponent resigned, etc., etc., and you, you know, many players, their impulse is, okay, this was good enough, I crushed my opponent, next, right? And you just fire up the next game. But here, even in a winning game, we found some nice ideas. Like here, we strengthened our knowledge of the fact that a4 is almost always the automatic response against a6 in the Benoni. That was the first uh, significant point. The second is that bishop b2, we strengthened our knowledge of these patterns when the king is on g1, bishop is on b2, as well as patterns of winning uh, rook, which you were able to solve because that second pattern that I tested you, you developed your visualization, but you also were aware that this was a kind of a familiar uh, tactical idea, knight g4, so you had a base to work from. So that was the second thing. And the third thing is this idea that very often you want uh, to play um, very patiently when you have the space advantage and suffocate your opponent more than, you know, demolish him. Um, so e5, not a bad move, but not not the most precise, something like king h1 instead. So three or so very instructive moments in this game that are helpful not just for your specific opening, how to handle the Benoni. There was one uh, very specific, one or two of those examples were very specific to the Benoni, like preventing this b5 move. But there are other examples like this e5 push that are less specific to the Benoni, more generally uh, helpful. Unfortunately, uh, my time management uh, has been uh, about as good as Grishuk's uh, for this lesson. <laughs> And uh, and so I've I've I've, I've looked uh, in in somewhat narcissistic fashion. We've spent uh, this lesson looking at seventy five percent my games and twenty five percent yours. Um, perhaps we might do this again. Uh, I don't know how how that works for you. It's not something we've spoken about. How it works for me, for you, for the platform. But if we do this again, we'll we'll resume, and I promise we will uh, we will focus a bit more on your games. Um, in the meantime, I, I hope you found the examples instructive and, and helpful and that the chat enjoyed uh, this format. It's very much uh, a new format. So if people enjoyed it, it's, it's, it's fantastic. I like that a lot of people were interacting in the chat, so very much uh, appreciate that. Uh, do you want to comment on, on the lesson? You're only allowed to say, you're, you're not allowed to say super nasty things. Those will have to be said uh, in private. But uh, other than that, uh, express yourself. <laughs> Well, I did enjoy the baritone smooth voice. Uh, I think you would be a perfect ASM artist. I think that uh, your choice of uh, games and examples were really good. Uh, actually, if I should be a little serious, I, really nice that you didn't go over my head, but you actually hit me uh, somewhere where I was able to find the ideas some of the time and I get a little gratification there, but always just pushing it a little bit and and just pushing me to to a level where I could find an idea and understand it, but maybe I would need some hints and I would need some corrections along the way. That really works for me. Pro my problem is that when I, you know, I think, okay, I'll, I'll learn something about chess. I'll watch this Peter Svitler video. And he just goes, all right, so you start on, on move 24. And of course here you have the, like your A pawn is really strong. And then I just look at that and I just go, I have no, no clue what the guy is talking about because he he doesn't even understand what it's like being such a terrible player and what, what's really good about you is that you are a good player but but you are not like you are you can see the human in me and you can see that you can understand how how bad i am yeah. so i really I, liked I, it I, yeah and i'm I down always, for more if you want i always uh you know i, I i'm constantly reflect and i'm grateful for the fact that while i am a good player i'm nowhere near as good as fiddler thanks thank god for that blessing of not being as good as fiddler um that it oh, that's not a knock on you though <laughs> he's like number 20 in the world or something of course of course no i understand that uh, you know earlier i knocked uh, grishuk and now you're knocking fiddler so i think we're about halfway through the chess 24 panel uh that's called <laughs> yeah chess 24 panel for the upcoming show uh that we've dissed 
on them and hopefully we can we can this on some more in the future so your, your camera seems to have gone if i'm not mistaken uh, okay so you're back uh but no but uh, jokes aside i very much appreciate uh that you felt the level was was okay i mean i think you did a you know you did a great job in terms of uh fielding the questions and i, I yeah i'm glad that that you feel like me that we got a we got a decent balance uh, i'm sure we can improve on the format uh but it's nice that you say you're you're down for more so uh we might be able to make that happen i hope um uh hope you guys uh, overall, everybody enjoyed it. Uh, people really, I think, um, from what I see in the chat, uh, appreciated it. And hopefully this is going to, you, Rune, will usher in a new era of online chess coaching. I think you're the man for the job. All right. Do you know who's also the man for the job? Besides, of course, you. It's our secret friend, Johan. And Johan, he has, I don't know if he made it himself or he, if he... He got somebody to do it, but he has made our our, uh, our outro animation for the show, and I'm just going to show it to you guys because it's super cool. Do you want to see it? Damn, yeah. yeah. So uh, do we say goodbye first? Yeah, we we say goodbye. Yeah. All right. And see you later, guys. Enjoy. Stick around for the Magnus Carlsen Invitational, but more importantly, stick around for this killer outro. <laughs> yeah and yeah uh bye chat i uh, i hope next time i will be able to hear all your brilliant comments i'm sure you're all excellent guys peace have you been wondering what kind of chess player you might be tactical positional fast dynamic aggressive what kind of chess player are you sign up for cochess.com and let a chess coach guide your journey. Coach S, your journey starts here.